Now I've seen my fair share of strange and weird movies. Movies that you could really only place in a special category that I like to call fever dream. Watching this movie on the surface really just makes no sense whatsoever, but once you start peeling back the layers is where everything starts coming together. But regardless of the message, you still just really wonder what the hell kind of drugs are these people using and how can I get my hands on them? Today's fever dream of a movie is called Mirror Mask, and the only reason why I even stumbled upon this movie was a recommended video that was called Look an idiot. Watching this clip out of context really makes you wonder what the hell is going on. Why is there a little girl talking to this dog sphinx creature with a human face? Why is there a dude in the background with like a mask on is like the colored mask? Why is there oozing black tentacles chasing them? Now this movie was actually created to pay homage to the 1986 Jim Henson film Labyrinth. And if you watch the movie, you could see a lot of similarities to the Labyrinth. And I will admit the style of the movie at first glance, I was kind of like, eh, I don't know. I don't know. But after a while, I started digging it. It's very unique as the world that Helena enters is full of creatures that defies logic and reason and combines that animation style with the live action style, which, you know, for the early 2000s leads to a lot of unsettling situations. The movie follows a young girl named Helena who parents are owners of a circus and everyone is a carny. I'm not gonna lie, I've always kind of dug, dig, uh, really do like the aesthetic of creepy, unsettling circuses. Now I know that's weird. I don't really like clowns per se, but just the strange, whimsical, a, a creepy, weird circus stuff is pretty cool. I mean, we just covered a movie that has similar style to this movie, but a circus really just feels like you're going to Disneyland in the setting of Mad Max. Oh, uh, well, yeah, the circus is nothing like that. It's just a place where they trap innocent animals to use them as nothing but objects and get a bunch of silly humanoid flesh bags to smack their finger meat together. Oh, oh, PETA, it's been so long. Why did you come back? Uh, yeah, bro, I joined the circus. <laughs> what do you mean, join the circus? With what skill set? What skills do you have? Well, I got a great thing going on. See, I go to circus to circus, and I release all of these captive animals free. And I pose as these animals in order to make sure that they don't notice. And sometimes, yeah, they catch me and just move to the next one. You know, living in a cage to feel the pain of these sorrowful animals that suffer through all of this eating slop sleeping in my own feces it's pretty free oh how the how do they not find out it, you you realize you're not an animal right you realize you look like a human how do they not well, normally i just hide behind a rock and mimic animals so i'm very good at it a wolf a lion and the hardest one of them all a chimpanzee have you ever thrown your own shit? It's pretty freeing. We do not have similar ideas of what would be considered freeing. But you know what, Peter? You bring up a good point. You want to know what is freeing? This new chair that I'm sitting in. Are you ready to transform your workplace into a place of comfort and productivity? Well, look no further than FlexiSpot. Specifically, their C7 ergonomic chair, the one I'm sitting on right now. The ultimate solution for those seeking style and support. Any type of adjustment you can imagine this chair has. It's adjustable headrest to cradle your neck. Lumbar support to embrace your lower back. And completely adjustable armrest to lay those heavy arms. I know you've been pumping the iron. I know you want to rest. Now before this flexi spot chair, I had things such as back pain, just body pain in general. And after getting a chair like this, everything has changed. This is perfect for focusing on your work, relaxing, gaming with your friends. You could even pop out the leg rest, pull the seat back and just sleep. Perfect sleeping position. Crafted with premium materials, built to last, FlexiSpot C7 offers durability and reliability that will stand the test of time. So I think it's time for you to elevate your workspace, or should I say elevate your gamer zone? With the FlexiSpot C7 chair and experience a new level of comfort and sophistication. Use the exclusive code C730 at FlexiSpot.com and you can get yourself $30 off your order today. Do it. Now, Helena is a young girl who is an artist who lives in this circus and she lives with her parents. And you could tell 
she kind of doesn't like it that much. She's a little bit in a rebellious phase. She's like, I don't want to keep doing this crap all the time, mom. I want to go have friends. I want to go have a real life, you know? And the fight escalates more and more to the point where she's like, mom, I hate you. I wish you were dead. And so her mom walks away. They do the whole circus performance and oopsies, mom's dead. Had a stroke, heart attack. I don't know. Never really explained. She, she, something happened to her. And this led to Helena getting very upset because she started thinking, oh no, this is the last thing I'm ever going to say to my mom is that I wish she were dead. And then we get to see Helena's room and Helena's room is completely covered in different art projects she makes because she's a very good artist. And if you could tell, pretty early on, this art is a lot of what we saw in that one clip, or at least I, I kind of piece that together that her art was the similar style of what world she was in in that one point. And at my first watch, this next scene completely confused me and I was absolutely at a loss of what was going on. But after watching the movie, it kind of makes a lot of sense. So we see this scene and we just assume that Helena is dreaming, right? She's just dreaming and there we see a, a mom on a stretcher, which she is obviously thinking about her mom. And then we see her looking at herself in the mirror and the mirror version of her starts laughing maniacally. So Helena wakes up and it seems like everyone is kind of missing. It's dark, no one's around and she gets a little bit concerned. So she goes outside to see a dude playing on the violin. But the thing is, all of these people are mirrors of people that are in real life, if you want to say it that way. It's kind of confusing. A, but they're basically parallels of a version of themselves in a different world. So a lot of the people she meet does look similar to people that she knows in the real world, but they aren't the same person. But anyway, she stumbles upon a violinist and two people juggling. Everything seems fine, a little bit confusing, and then all of a sudden, oh, they get turned into dust. They're dying. They're dead. Now they're running from this thing. Okay, that that went to 100 very quick. So now a dude's throwing fireworks at this dark black mass of goo stuff and then he turns into dust as well. All right, two people dead. This turns very dark very fast. So this world basically makes absolutely zero sense and the laws of nature and physics don't really ever apply here. For example, every single quote unquote animal like cat dog, whatever, they have a human face, but the humans always wear masks. And her little juggling sidekick, uh, Valentine, that is his name. Now, and I would like to mention Valentine's probably one of the best characters in the movie. He's just funny and witty and just an all around fun character. But he's also greedy and an asshole sometimes, which you will see in the future. But he kind of acts as her guide throughout this creepy, strange world. And one thing that he points out is she's the only one in this world who doesn't wear a mask because every quote unquote human that lives in this world always has a mask except her. And I feel like this definitely has a little bit of a deeper meaning here because, you know, like people wear masks, right? You know, that whole thing. That's what the mask is. That's what the point of the mask is. I can't breathe when you're not there. More like I can't sing. <laughs> Seriously, who told this man to pick up a singing career? And another hilarious strange thing is uh, they were able to fly on books by yelling at the book, saying offensive things to it and acting like the book is bad in order for the book to feel bad about itself, realize you're not gonna read it and fly back to the library. So they use that to uh, ride on top of the books to fly back to the library. The most interesting, strange stuff that only a dude on drugs can do. Holy shit, it's Neil Gaiman. That's the dude who wrote Coraline. This just makes a lot more sense. Uh, the reason that's so cool that he wrote Coraline is I was actually gonna make a lot of references to Coraline because there are a lot of similarities here, like the mirror world, the world that's like a parallel of the world that she's in, like Coraline with the other mother and the other dad and all that situation. That honestly makes me like this movie even more. Now, one thing I'll admit I don't like too much about the movie, but it's it's kind of just a visual note, is the vignette that happens the entire time. If you guys don't know what a vignette is, it's basically like where they darken a circle around the screen where it's like you're looking through a lens and it, I don't like it. 
it honestly just makes things feel blurry, more blurry than they are. Which don't get me wrong, I'm sure they were going with that aspect, but the vignette really gets a lot sometimes. So then we follow this spider creature to the other mother, or at least that's what I'm gonna call it, the other mother, which is just the dark, creepy version of her mom in real life. So anyway, after Helenus talks to Valentine for a little bit, she discovers his name and also discovers that he is looking for a juggler. So the reason Valentine starts following her around everywhere is because he is desperate to find a juggler and she just so happens to be a juggler. And then Valentine starts spitting, talking about how do you know if you're happy or sad without a mask? You know, that's what the mask is. Okay, I'll stop, I'll stop. And oh my God, like the creatures and weird uh, things that are walking around are just, they don't don't make any logical sense how they even exist. So then she discovers that these shadows are basically taking over the entire town and taking over the entire world. And the people of the town are actually evacuating because of this black mass that is destroying everything. And then these stick leg long creatures that are supposedly cops uh, walk up and grab her and start calling her the princess. So they grab her with their bony stick legs and bring her to the, the king of this town. And obviously we find out that the king is actually her dad, but the mirror version of her dad. So we start to realize that the parallel of the daughter in this world, they're mistaking the parallel of her for her. So somehow she got sucked in and swapped places with the other daughter. So we find out that the queen of light is in somewhat of a coma. And the king tells us the story of a girl who came over from the land of shadows to pose as a princess saying that she is a princess. However, this princess left one day and left the queen in this coma. And ever since then, darkness and shadows and, and creepy things that came out and started killing people and doing terrible things, and that is what has been happening. And the king starts talking about a charm, a charm that was stolen, which is the gateway between worlds and the thing that holds balance in the world, which we could start thinking about title of the movie, Charm. So she decides that the only logical thing to do in the situation is try to help the queen awaken in order for her to figure out what to do. So she heads out to the land of the shadows in order to figure out what happened to this said charm. And of course, Valentine happens to tag along. And then we get another situation that just defies logic and is just goofy, but I freaking love it. So she walks up to the librarian, which is just a bunch of makeshift books and things put together into a creature. She asks for a really useful book and the dude's like, yeah, of course, just grab a net. Why do they need a net? I guess books fly. He catches a book called The Absolute History of Everything and then the librarian reads from it. And then he basically says that Helena is the one who technically created the world by her drawings. She drew on the front side and then she drew on the back side, creating the two parallel worlds, the world who lives in the light and the one who lives in the shadows. And then a little book lands on her head and it's called A Really Useful Book. And what does this book do? give really useful hints of the specific situation that they're in. And the first thing that is read is remember what your mother said. And then it says, why don't you look out the window, which precedes her journey. And then she discovers something very interesting. While Valentine is babbling about all these riches that he potentially will get if he finds the charm, she looks out a window to discover her own room, her real life room, her mirrored room. And this is where you start realizing that she is inside of all of those drawings on the wall. But something is quite interesting. She believes that she's dreaming right now. However, she's not in bed. She doesn't see her real body sleeping in bed. Something else that's interesting is Valentine doesn't see her room. He sees something completely different, which that comes into play later on. Because looking out that window, they see the parallel of the real life version of them. But Valentine is seeing the parallel room or world that his real life person is. So Valentine decides to stop in between the worlds of the light and dark because he's a little baby, he's a little scared. And this is the scene that I saw on YouTube, the look and idiot scene. She walks forward to meet a sphinx who tells her her riddle and if she does not get the riddle right. He will eat her bone and all. Mm. And this part is quite hilarious because the reason that she wins the riddle is because of basically making up her own shit. Or let me rephrase that. She's making up her own uh, personal real life experience of a specific situation that goes toward this riddle. So 
technically she's right, but it's not the answer that the Sphinx is looking for. But regardless, he still accepts it as an answer. Now I think you'll find it's William. I saw him. He was on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon show, and he was limping on three in the evening because he hurt his paw. So in order to get past the Sphinx, she tells him a riddle, which he can't solve, which is quite hilarious. And then it gets even funnier when Valentine notices all of the black ooze coming for him. So he runs to the Sphinx, gives him a riddle, and this happens. Tell me. Look, an idiot. Where? Such a good scene. Such a good joke. I love it. And now we get to meet two stone dudes laying on top of each other, holding a box. I, 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 I don't know. Your guess is better than mine. I, I don't know. So weirdly, this scene is quite sad. So anyway, we find out that they are holding a box, which apparently is important. So they convince these two stone creatures that are lying on top of each other to give them the box because they start getting sucked up by the black ooze. And this part's kind of sad because like the one of the one of the rock dudes or girl rock girl, I don't I don't know. They get sucked into the black ooze. So now all that's left is just one stone dude. I don't know why I was sad. Like, who are these? Like, I, I don't give a shit about these two stone dudes. But for some reason, I got upset and mad and sad whenever the other one got sucked up. Who's he going to lay on now? You know, he's just going to lay there by himself. So the last thing these big, the last thing the big stone dude says is mirror mask. And we find out inside of the box is a key. So we start getting a little bit more clues, a little bit more idea of where we're going with this. So in order to figure out more about this mirror mask that they heard about, they go to this lady who does masks. She creates the mask. And something interesting Helena finds is when she looks into the bathroom mirror after washing her hands, she discovers herself, but not herself necessarily, a more rugged, edgy, cool version of herself in her room. And this is where she starts realizing this princess, this girl that everyone's looking for is actually her who is now in the real life. And the thing is, this mirrored version of Helena is kind of uh, awful. She's kind of doing terrible things, being mean to everything, yelling at her parents, being a jerk, you know, you know, kissing boys, you know, do it, get, getting tattoos and uh, stuff like that. And holy shit, this old lady is creepy. Like who comes up with these masks? That is absolutely terrifying. It's just like a, a melted version of Squidward. Who um, does this? What the Honestly, this old lady kind of reminds me of April Spink and Mary Enforceable. You know, the two old ladies with all the dogs and stuff. It's a similar situation. Old lady, you know, gives them a little bit of good advice and with a bunch of Sphinx around her. And then something interesting in the little helpful book that kind of makes things worse is don't let them see you afraid, which ironically makes them feel afraid, which makes all of the Sphinxes realize that they're afraid, which makes the Sphinxes chase after them. And then Valentine starts ranting about how he used to have a tower and then he broke up with this tower because he had commitment issues. And the sad part is it actually makes sense later on in the movie. I I don't understand this movie whatsoever, but it, but it's cool. How big is it? Huge. So she takes the advice of the stone guy from earlier and gets higher. And then she stumbles upon muscle ducks, m gorilla, uh, beak birds, gorilla birds, but their beaks are removable. I have no goddamn clue what these things are. I, I don't know. But anyway, they kind of help. They help up until the point these black uh, oozing birds fly and land on its face and then it controls the gorilla bird to capture uh, Helena and, and jump away. And then it becomes an all out chase scene where some of these bird gorillas are getting slapped in the face by black ooze and turning evil where some of the other bird gorillas are staying good with their little beak holes and grabbing Valentine and jumping and swinging everywhere. I have no fucking clue what's going on. I have no idea what's going on, but it's cool. It's cool. So using her brain to remember where she put stuff on her drawing, she was able to figure out the location 
of where all of the keyholes are. But the problem is there was a lot of keyholes. So they're gonna have to go through a lot of different ones to figure out what's going on. And then the mirrored version of Helena realizes what's going on and gets a little angry. So she ends up taking the location that they're at and putting them in a completely different location, uh, which is actually closer to the other mother, the scary shadow mother. But in the process of that, Helena actually hurts her arm. So Valentine decides to go out and scout and see what's going on. And then the sad scene, the angry scene, or at least the one that pissed me off a little bit, I like Valentine. I think he's a cool character. I think he's funny, charismatic, and great, but he's also a giant greedy piece of shit. So Helena gets captured by the Shadow Queen. And then the Shadow Queen's like, hey, yo, you're my daughter. And then she's like, nah, -uh. and she's like, oh, you'll do. I mean, you'll, you'll be my daughter. Like, I don't care if you're not, you're just gonna be my daughter. Turns out it was actually Valentine that sold her out. Valentine was bribed by a hat and a little bit of jewels in order for Helena to get caught. And this sucked, man. I hated this part. You know, I liked Valentine. He was a great guy. And all of a sudden he just fucks over Hel Helena. You're a dick. And this depressing scene gets even more depressing, or should I say disturbing, as Helena basically becomes mind controlled by the Shadow Queen. This is the one quote unquote musical number in the movie where all of these puppeteered clockwork steampunk weird creatures come out of these things and turn her into a shadow zombie. And the song in this movie is so cool because it really treads that line between a pretty song and a very off-putting song. It really, is unsettling. I don't really know how to describe it unless you listen to it. But the notes are off just enough where you just feel slightly strange throughout it. And the way that the voices are singing, they're very light and airy and, and almost like a whisper. And then in the end, they turn her into this zombie where her eyes turn completely black and now she's completely under the spell of the Shadow Queen. Stars fall down from the sky. So Valentine, feeling a little bit uh, sad about what he did, goes to find the mirror mask himself, uses the key and goes through every single keyhole and finally finds the right one, only to find a note from the other Helena that states that she stole the mirror mask. So Valentine goes and finds the now mind-controlled shadow uh, Helena. He walks up to her and obviously apologizes. She doesn't even know what's going on because her brain is all scrambled. And the way he was able to bring her back was actually juggling. The thing that they first bonded with, the thing that she is known for in the circus, the juggling ended up breaking her out of that shadow mind-controlled juice. And we actually discover that the other Helena hid the mirror mask in inside of her own room because she realized that her herself would probably do the same thing. And she pushes her face into the mirror, revealing the mirror mask. And then they get in a boss fight with um, the shadow lady's face. Uh, I, I, what, what is this thing? <laughs> what the, what is this thing? Is this like a, it's like a tentacle face. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't I got no idea what's going on. What is it? What is this shit? So they are very close to dying, right? Like the big black ooze is coming for them. They're going to turn into dust. And then Valentine starts calling for his tower that apparently he broke up with. And then Helena says, you should probably apologize to the tower for getting in an argument. And he's like, nah, -uh, I was right. And then he finally apologized and a goddamn tower appears out of the fucking sky. I. Bro's got a relationship with the tower. I mean, come on, fellas. Single fellas out there. I mean, what are you whining about? Just go, go have, uh, have a relationship with the tower. And then right when they get in the tower and right when she was about to leave and make everything back to normal, it looks like the other Helena has ripped up, tore up all the papers off the wall, which are all the entrances to the other world are now gone. Which I mean, I don't know why she didn't think about that in the first place. Helena, but Helena at the last second was able to put the mirror mask on and they were sucked to the same mirror and became the same person because all it was it was the same person the whole time. It was two sides of the same coin. Referencing the Helena who 
uh, uh, hates everyone, hates hates her parents, wants to live a different life, hates everything here, and the Helena who actually likes it here and likes his mom and dad. You know, you, you guys get it, right? That's the that's the that's the thing. That's what's going on here. So in the end of the movie, they find out that her mother actually survived the surgery, and not only that, but Valentine. The real life Valentine actually ran into Helena in the real world because he actually wanted to be a part of the circus. And, you know, what a weird and strange and cool movie. Honestly, I feel like this movie's definitely in the underrated category because I feel like it's not a digestible movie. It's not a entry level movie, if you want to call it that. You, you need to have a certain mindset when watching this movie because of how strange it is. But I love it. I think it's fantastic. The uniqueness, the, the style, it's really cool. The only thing I can really complain about is the vignette and the old timey flicker uh, thing of the other world. But I know that was a style choice. Personally, I just didn't like it that much. But if you like this video, you should definitely subscribe to me right now and like the video and share with your friends. All right. Okay. Okay, little pup. Do it right now. Come on. Do it right now. I'm waiting. Done? Notifications? Done? No? Not, not good enough for that? Okay, uh, fair enough. You know, teach their own.